Okay. Um, great. Good afternoon, guys. I'm not wearing my pajamas, even though it may seem like it. Um, I'm in a different room than you guys are probably used to. And I'm here to answer questions around uh, careers and the career process. Specifically this week, we want people to pick tracks. Um, there's a tutorial that's planned for tomorrow. The schedule, as everyone is aware, I believe, is that by Wednesday, everyone needs to, we want a first choice of one of the three tracks. And by Saturday, we want a more, excuse me, a more final or formal definition. Um, if you guys allow me one moment, I'm just going to open the window. It's a bit hot in here. Just give me a second. So the advantage of uh, doing people standing up when they're on video calls is if you can tell uh, what they're wearing underneath, because sometimes people wear like funny things where it's not usually visible. So it's always a good way to check, get them to stand up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's that's what we're aiming to do. This is a really big week because this is where uh, we start to understand or to figure out how is how's everyone feeling about their job readiness where each of you will put um, your brain power um, to work to figure out, to translate all the work that you've done towards your first look at the job market. Um, I would also, I also want to say a couple of words before we go into the Q&A about uh, choice of track. I think some people are very worried about it and the only reason to worry as far as I can see is the belief that there is a right decision or a wrong decision, or perhaps that there's an optimal decision. I think, honestly, in practice, there's no real optimal decision, and there, I'll tell you why. Um, you're going to choose a track, but I think what will have a much bigger impact on your long-term success are is things that you can't control at this point. So is your manager a good manager? Are your colleagues helpful? Is the company going to be successful? Um, sometimes you get put onto a project and it's great, sometimes it's horrible. Um, sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes you have a illness in your family, which means that you can get your work done, but you're not able to really put your teeth into it and um, grind really hard. <clears throat> so there's all these things that are outside of your control. So I would rather um, try and find what is the best mix of, and somebody asked today, should I go for what I'm good at or what I want to do? And the answer, as most things, is both. Um, you shouldn't just only you shouldn't only pick what you're interested in so if somebody wants to be, become a brain surgeon um, and they want to start applying for brain surgery jobs uh, in a month that's unrealistic because it's going to take you longer to pick up the skills and the knowledge uh, for brain surgery than uh, one month but so the, the skills and the knowledge and that sort of alignment has to be there but you also don't want to end up in a dead-end job and this is why we've been specific about picking these jobs because these are all high growth jobs and interesting fields. We're not training people to be Excel jockeys um, because we don't really want you to do that. So you need to do both. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about which track, but pick the one which satisfies your interest and um, which is realistic in terms of the skill profile that you have. Um, and then I have a couple other things to say, to say, but I'm gonna go, let's go into the Q&A because I want to hear from I want to hear from you guys. So why don't we, uh, we can do hands or we can type. We can do a mix of those things. <laughs> okay, yeah, Martin. Uh, okay, thank you, and uh, thank you for giving me the privilege to ask uh, the first as the first one. Yeah, so <clears throat> I wanted to ask, uh, like, is it um, is there an opportunity, like, for somebody to because there's also that f there's um there's something I wanted to I wanted to practice like both uh, web three and machine learning engineering. Mm -hmm. 
but is there a field that combines the two the two fields uh, so that you can practice both of them and uh, grow in in all those aspects and not actually also even the data engineering portion and um, yeah like is, is there a field that encompasses like the especially web3 and machine learning engineering yeah? so i don't know if there's <clears throat> so these these constructs that we have are slightly artificial right there's you're right in that the data engineers will probably do some machine learning engineering and vice versa and if you're at the right company that's working in web3 there may be some machine learning engineering as well so my answer to you would be rather think about the type of company that you want to apply to and the um, team that you're working within rather than um i mean i don't think there's well, I don't know. I mean, actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't have a, a perfect view of the market. Web3 is also new to us. But if I were you, what I would do is then uh, I would still pick one of them and I would uh, frame it as you're a Web3 engineer and you also have machine learning engineering competencies. And then, and then you see how it goes. Binyam? Okay, thanks, Aaron. Uh, so, my question is, uh, uh, we've been asking some questions, Miriam, Le, earlier today. So, uh, one of them was uh, something similar to what I'm about to ask right now. So, uh, I understand that you have partnerships to uh, several uh, companies. So, mm. uh, how does that come into play when, uh, during the job search and that means uh, Miriam told us that we will be conducting our own uh, researches and uh, coming up with uh, job opportunities and that your roles are uh, around uh, helping us uh, land uh, a job or improving our uh, how we look in general mm -hmm. the social mm -hmm. media in uh, our, our CVs yeah uh, so uh, don't uh, partnerships uh, help us here? So I think there's, <clears throat> so I have a couple of things to say. One is um, the only thing we can do is get you an interview. We can never get you through the interview. So a lot of the preparation that we're trying to help you with is how do you get through the interview? Um, so remember, remember that. So it doesn't matter even if I was to introduce you to my brother who, I mean, he's not hiring, but if he was, he would still interview you. If we wanted to hire you, we would still interview you. So keep that in mind, there are no free jobs. And there's not a single company, person, individual, anywhere in the world that'll hire you on the basis of anyone's recommendation without at least speaking to you first. So remember, you have to prepare yourself to go through the interviews. In terms of partnerships, it's true, we are working um, and doing what we can to try and say, hey, company ABC, have a look at these people. Are you interested? And by the way, <clears throat> they've been through our training and this is why we think that it'll be useful uh, to apply the filter of look at our candidates because they're pre-tested and they're pre-vetted as opposed to just going out on the open job market. So we will do that. Um, and the process we follow will be as transparent as possible. If somebody comes to us, we'll ask them what they're looking for. And then we will match the people um, who have the closest match to what they're looking for. And we will do that in for one position, we'll, sh we'll share three profiles and they can choose who they want to pick. So I, I believe that answers your question. I think you're asking, I mean, there's an implicit question, which is, and we've had this in the past where somebody says, look, I actually don't want to do the hard work um, and I don't really care if I get a job right now. And I hope that these guys are going to do the hard work and introduce companies to me. Could be, I mean, we're going to do what we can to uh, bring companies on board, but it's going to take us a lot longer. A, and B, it's going to be a lot harder for you when you want to go to your next job and you have to go through this process by yourself. So we want everyone to be working hard to try and match and to be applying and to get into this rhythm of how do you, I mean, to an extent, this is, there's a job application API and you have to get used to interacting with that. How do you present yourself in a way that an employer anywhere in the world is, um, is used to you? And that's, once you once you get over that fear and once you develop that skill you'll be amazed at how much of the world is open to you so short answer i would like everyone to be ready 
to hope that there's absolutely no support ready from us. And we have figured out, we think, how to get people interviews. And that skill will be very useful for you to go through the process and to apply and to fail and to learn um, and to go through the first interview and to fail and to learn. Um, and in parallel, we'll be offering a little bit of support. Um, and that's that's what I would say. But does, does that answer your question, Binya? Yes, it does. Uh, uh, by the way, I didn't actually, I don't mind actually doing the research myself. I, do, I was just curious how the partnerships uh, will come into uh, the play. Uh, may I add one more question? Yeah, but I want to add one thing before that. The reason There's a reason why. Uh, we want to get to the scale of about 500 per year. That's our That's our current scaling goal. And we don't want to be the step that limits how fast we can place people into work. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two is we thought quite a bit about what, what we are. We train people and we support people to get people into work. But what that means is you do your training, you get work, you make your paid for contribution, and then you're free. There's no obligation beyond that. And so we didn't want to get into a model where we train you and then you have to work for 10 Academy or you have to pay a percentage of your salary. We thought it was much better if we just say, this model works because we can, if you follow the system, you get a job that'll allow you to pay the cost of your training and then you're free to go and do what you want. If you wanna go and after you, pay, after you do this, after five years, if you wanna become a writer, you wanna become a sculptorist, you wanna become an actor, everything's fine. But that's that's the scale that we've built into the model. So you have another question, Binyam? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. My other question is: um, I've been looking through the profiles of the previous batch. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody earlier shared a link to me earlier, and uh, I noticed that uh, uh, some really good-looking uh, uh, profiles have not yet uh, gotten a, a job yet. So. Uh, can you tell us what's the uh, kind of X factor or if there is any uh, that uh, differentiates uh, someone, um, uh, people, people from those who get job and those who can't or who don't? Uh, there's no, <clears throat> so I think there's no magic formula. Um, so let me ask you a question back. Do you know of some people who applied for this training and even if they were clever, hardworking, smart people, they, they dropped out at some point? Actually, yes, I do. So why did they drop out or why are they not here? Uh, some personal reasons, some were not sure whether they wanted to continue or not. I would say that's the, it's by and large the same thing. Um, I think confidence is a big issue as well um, because it is hard, right? You're nobody, I think, I will, I'll say nobody, but that's, it won't, maybe a few people will, but the vast majority of people here will fail, uh, will not get an offer after their first few interviews. And so it's a question of who has, the stomach to apply for 200 jobs to go to five interviews and to get one offer. And it could be more than 200 jobs. Um, and a big reason is it's not, the system is just, um, yeah, it's, that's just how the system is. And it's not only because you're from Africa or because you're looking for your first jobs. The system, the system just is inefficient. I was, we got into this Replit program. We were talking to the CEO of Replit. They just raised, he's from Jordan, they just raised $80 million. They're an $800 million company. And they had applied to this Y Combinator accelerator three, four, or five times, and they kept getting rejected. And it, they just got lucky. A personal contact introduced him to one of the founders in the cab. He's like, but you guys are doing amazing work. So why, you know, why don't you come to Y Combinator? And he's like, well, we've applied four or five times. And you guys keep saying no. So sometimes the systems are not perfect, right? The guy who's reading your CV is having a bad day or they already have somebody in mind. So I would say it's just a question of, um, it's just a question of the right mindset and the stomach and also the right expectations. It's going to be, I would say, 80% of the effort of the training um, in terms of time and effort, but emotionally it'll be harder. Right now we're telling you what to do. We're saying Wednesday you submit this, Saturday you submit this, Mary is doing her community building sessions, we have daily stand-ups. 
basically you can go to sleep and if you do what we tell you to do you can feel successful at the end of the training uh, during the supported job search phase it's going to be much more independent we will be there but when you're asked a hard question in an interview and you don't come up with a great answer and you think of a great answer afterwards you're probably going to feel bad and then it's that resilience and that that bouncing back from it so i think the problems they're not different they're not easier or worse they're just different problems um the other thing that i'll say is this i think the the one of the big differences between university or school and getting a job is that technical skills are half as important um the ability to communicate is the other half of the importance and that is something that people really test in an interview and one thing I, the best summary of an interview that i found is an interview is to find figure three things out one is can you do the job so do you have the technical skills great um do you want to do the job are you motivated are you going to be available are you going to be hungry are you going to be reliable number two that's great and the third is will you fit into the team and this is where, I mean, that's partly related to one and to can you do the job and also um, do you fit into the team? That's where the communication comes in, especially if you're working remotely in a different time zone, um, perhaps not, not in your native language. This is where some of the challenges come in. And this is partly during the, um, the sparring exercise, what I wanted to test. And if the people who didn't understand the question right away in an interview, they're going to struggle because no matter what, how as good as their answer is technically, they're answering the wrong question. So I think in a large part, um, it is a question of, I mean, communication is one aspect of it, I'll say that. Very well. Thank you for the response. Uh, I think that pretty much answers everything. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'm going to go and just look at the chat. <clears throat> Um, so you did, yeah, I would encourage you to try it. Um, I don't know how you, so how would you do it? I mean, you could try, but how do you know? So yeah, you're, if you're ready to do double the work, you can do that. Um, why wouldn't you, so there's one thing that's limited, which is time and maybe energy is also limited. So if you have a limited amount of time and energy, instead of optimizing two CVs and figuring out which CV fits for which job and trying to have that perfect match, why wouldn't you spend that time and energy picking one and going a lot deeper? So that if you pick Web3 that you can go and during an interview, because you will get interviews, you can say, look, instead of saying, this is my beautiful ML engineering CV, look at me, you can say, this is a project that I built on the Ethereum blockchain using Infura. This is my Algorand implementation of something else. Um, this is an open source contribution that I made. This is a blog post that I wrote. Or you can show them two CVs. So that's, that's your choice to make. But you can do it, but you need to decide uh, how you optimize your time and energy. Does that make sense? Faith, is it related to this or is it uh, another question? It's a question. But is it? OK, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, reading the, the manual you gave us, um, it says uh, if you can't do it, uh, a website, um, react.js website within four hours, um, definitely 48, uh, 48. You should go to 48. Um, you should go to uh, data engineering. Um, I personally can't uh, read that uh, website. Uh, but again, uh, if the project that we did uh, recently about data engineering uh, would help me to evaluate myself, I also don't feel like uh, uh, suitable for the data engineering track. So, uh, I would but that was a hard how... project. That was a hard project. I mean, that was yeah, this but, company. Uh, they they didn't do it themselves. Mm, but I would like to know how uh, strict is that condition saying if you can't do this in four eight hours, then uh, definitely you should go for uh, data engineering. I know at some point it reads this is only guidance, but uh, how how strict it is. So I mean, this is this is why we have to get to individual coaching. So maybe Faith, we can have a you should talk to your assigned tutor, and then we can also talk one on one because these are only guidelines. But this is where it comes into every person has to make an individual choice. Each and every person's 
CV, profile, 50 letter summary, we have to work with each and every person to make the right choice. So I think it's worth uh, discussing uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but it, it is only a guideline. Why is it 48 hours, and not 72 hours? Um, it's, it's just a guideline. It's also, I mean, the question I would also ask to everyone here is if you can't do it in 48 hours, how much, if you spent a week practicing, could you do it in 48 hours? Because then maybe it's worth spending that week if you're interested in ML engineering. It's, each of you has to change your mindset and think, I'm going to make a decision this week. And after that, my next couple of weeks are going to be working to make the implementation of that decision possible. So if you want to go for ML engineering, then you do need to develop some job, some web development skills, or it'll make your life a lot easier. If you want to go for Web3 engineering and you don't know anything about how the Ethereum blockchain works, you're going to have to learn that. And the, for most of you, um, there are areas that you'll have to improve on. Almost everyone here will need to improve their SQL. Almost everyone here will need to improve their Python. Um, people will have to redo different projects. People are going to have to think about um, there is just a lot of work to do. So I would, uh, it's a guideline, but I would think of it differently. Don't say, can I do this or can I not do this? You should think, do I, am I ready to invest the work that's required um, to get there? And this is where each individual person has their own circumstances. Some people need to get a job tomorrow because their family needs money or their personal circumstances mean they have to earn money. We've had people who have come through the program and they say, look, I live at home, food shows up at, in the morning, afternoon and evening, I don't have any expenses, I can buy internet and I'm ready to spend three months just reading and learning. So I, I don't know what your, your personal circumstance is, but I'm happy to talk to you about it. Uh, thank you, that answers my question. Okay. Uh, Testify is asking, um, have not been covered as ML and, uh is hard yeah it is hard um but i would encourage you to do some reading and some thinking um yeah i mean one of the one of the reasons why data engineering is hard for us to teach is because it's very expensive it usually requires a lot of data which means a lot of uh a big computing environment um yeah data and getting a good data set is difficult it's also a question of getting the right speed of data so we could look at like stock market data or some weather data where it's like a high volume of data coming in. We are going to be doing a little bit more data engineering. It is hard. Web3 is, we only did one project. Um, and if an employer looks at, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not too worried about the second part of your problem question because there are projects that you can showcase. And I think the projects that we will help you showcase will be useful for data engineering as well as for Web3. But this is where we've said, and I believe this, and we've also changed. Um, batch four, we said, get ready in three months. And we realized that for most people, the ready, the time to readiness is somewhere in between three and six months. So in that additional three months, you're going to have to put some work in um, and do a capstone project and keep learning and keep working and keep redoing your projects. Um, and work with your colleagues here in the batch and with us to keep improving. Um, uh, we have no quotas uh, in terms of the number of students to join which track. Uh, I think that if anyone, th there is this bias against uh, data engineering for some unknown reason to me. People seem to think that data engineering is 60% of ML engineering, that ML engineering, those are the that's the Premier League and um, data engineering is sort of like two tiers down. And I think that's absolutely not the case. Um, so no, we have no quotas. The flow chart, um, <clears throat> so I hope to testify number three, I answer the question for Faith. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right, the, the back end job. So Web3, to be honest with everyone here, we're going to have to figure out Web3 a little bit more. We've never worked to place anyone into Web3. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the reason why we still talk about front end is a lot of Web3 companies or blockchain companies are still basically spending a lot of time and energy on building a nice interface and the blockchain work that they're doing is super simple. And the kind of joke that we've heard from a lot of employers is 
don't ask us about our, uh, I mean, I'll actually tell you, one of our, uh, one of the people who got hired from batch four, the machine learning engineering that this person was doing was basically using Excel and the uh, linear regression function within Excel. And this is a company that's raised uh, venture capital fundings, kind of well public, and people are talking about it in different places. But yeah, I mean, there's not, it's not a very complicated model. Um, batch three, four, yeah, so we're getting better at it. In batch three, it was pretty, it was pretty slow at the start, um, six month period after six months. Um, I would say batch four after six months, we were below 50%. Um, and so this is where we're working to improve um, because we're starting this a lot earlier. So we didn't start this process until one or two months after the training in batch four. We started it, but we didn't have a clear enough idea and we hadn't figured out that sort of algorithm, how do you get people interviewed? So we're starting earlier, we have a much clearer idea. We had never forced people to choose a track before and then we realized that afterwards everyone had to choose one track, otherwise people were getting lost and they were getting uh, going off in different directions. Um, people who didn't get jobs, in my opinion, it was mostly because they didn't stick with the plan, they didn't stay focused on what it is that they were supposed to be doing. Um, and that sometimes for personal reasons, sometimes not for personal reasons. Um, I think we also had mistaken expectations where, and I know there's people here who are handing in their assignments, but they're just scraping by and they're not uh, necessarily understanding what it is uh, exactly what they're doing, um, which is okay. But keep in mind that employers are going to hire you. I mean, why does an employer hire you? So if an employer is paying you $10, it's because they want to earn $50 of value out of you. Um, most of you are going, going to be applying for remote jobs for companies anywhere in the world. And what that means is there are some really, really cool jobs, very high growth jobs, but it also means that you're competing with people from around the world. Um, so you need to actually know what you're doing. So your certificate is not, it may help you get an interview, but it's not gonna help you get through the interview. It's not gonna help you get through the interview. It's not gonna help you be, um, just the certificate is not gonna help you get through the interview or be successful in your job. Um, that's where you have to answer questions. That's where you need to be able to walk people through your code. So I would encourage everyone to just relax, pick one track, narrow the solution space, calm down and say, you know what, I wanna spend the next four months getting really good at this one thing. And once I get really good at this one thing, I can get a job, I can earn some money. Um, but more than that, once you get a job, you'll learn a lot of other things. You'll learn that work is only, the technical side of your work is only 50% of the job. Um, maybe even less than 50%. Communicating with colleagues, dealing with uncertain other aspects, managing your manager, dealing with infrastructure, dealing with projects that change. You'll learn all of that. And then after one year doing whatever it is that you're doing, you can go and start thinking about what it is that you want to do next. So I think that's probably why um, most people who don't get placed, that's probably why most of them uh, are in that situation because there's this, I mean, there are some people here who are doing okay, but they have gaps in their knowledge. All of us have gaps in our knowledge, but instead of trying to gloss them over and just um, pretending and trying to get a job, it's probably better to take it seriously and say, you know what, I really want to improve in these five areas where I'm weak and uh, work on those areas. Uh, yes, Nardos, all tracks will have the same support. Um, I mean, Web3 Web is a bit of an unknown beast. Um, is it a disadvantage? We're, yeah, we're also gonna be learning with you. On the other hand, there's very few people who globally, Web3 talent is uh, in short supply. On the other hand, there's the so-called crypto winter. On the other hand, it's a growing field. So I don't know. Um, it's, it's very hard to say. Uh, how will you fit in the team assess? I would say people just talk and do you, you know, I tried to, when we did these um, debates, it was pretty clear to me, who did I feel comfortable with? Did you understand the question that I was saying? Did you, people evaluate, I mean, sometimes just based on uh, 
language quality, based on comfort, based on is the person funny. I would say it's pretty similar to, I mean, sometimes it really is just to like the person. And so this is something you can practice. You should be talking. This is why we want people to speak during stand-ups. This is why we want you to practice in the community building sessions because the ability to, and I think you guys are doing great, the ability to sort of jump in and say, this is where I want to go on holiday um, and to give a meaningful answer. It's really useful and important practice. And maybe that sort of thing won't directly be asked uh, in the interview, but it will help you in the short and I think in the uh, longer term as well. Um, Jeremy, yes, you're going to have to do some more Web3 projects. Um, but I think you can also extend some of those projects. Um, so we do have this idea we want you to do a capstone independent project during your job search phase. You will have time. So every single person here has to know that even if um, the most happy, willing, friendly company in the world that wants to hire you, it will be, I would say, on average, minimum four and probably at least six weeks from sending an email to the company to starting work. These things take time. You're going to need an interview, a second interview, a contract, HR, how are you going to get paid, who's paying your taxes, um, how do you get the money, how do you get onboarded onto the system. These things don't take time. And if you want a full-time job, which is different than working on Upwork, um, it's like getting, I always say that, uh, I don't know if you guys have Tinder or any of these sort of dating apps. Um, Upwork and freelancing work is like dating on, you know, it's like let's have fun together on the weekend where you don't really ask serious questions. But if you're going to get married, um, which is like getting a job, then you do ask questions. You don't just go spend a weekend together. You kind of take care of, okay, where am I putting my sofa and who? You, you have to organize that stuff. So you will have time because nothing is going to move super, super quickly. Um, Kevin asks, so Kevin, let's, let's talk about it individually. Talk with your tutor and, um, yeah, but I think Kevin, you're also talking about your, if you're not comfortable in, so when we talk about front end web development, it's, it's maybe a little bit of a misnomer A react website is fine. Even if you don't know react people who don't know software engineering, um, are going to struggle. Why? It's not because of the language, but it's the approach to coding. It's knowing how to do testing. Um, it's knowing how to implement loops. It's knowing how to comment. It's knowing deployment. It's knowing how to use different tools. Um, it's not. Re it's really not about the language. So there's a difference between the difference, I believe, and I'm getting a little bit out of my expertise here, but the difference between coding and software engineering is coding is like you cook at home by yourself. So you can make a meal for yourself and your family. That's fine. It doesn't make you a chef. A chef is somebody who can go and work at a hotel and that chef can make food for five people and can also make food for 500 people. And the difference is the chef knows, okay, if I need to make food for 500 people, I understand what that means in terms of preparation, in terms of time, who do I need to work with? How do I maintain hygiene? How do I make sure the food is warm? How do I serve it at the right time? Yeah. Um, so Jeremy, uh, you, this week, so this week, this is why we're forcing you this week to make a choice. So Saturday, by Saturday 20 at 8 p.m. UTC uh, is by when you have to make a choice and you have to stick with it. Um, Amal, our recommendation is $1,000 US to start. That's that's where we think you should be starting. I think some of you may ask for more, some of you may ask for less, but I think that's a reasonable starting point. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to stay there, but I think that's a reasonable starting point. Um, self-employed, we don't encourage it um, because, I mean, if you wanted to be self-employed, you probably wouldn't have come here. Um, one of the things that I heard that really stuck with me is in 2000. 14, I think, or maybe 2015, and it was a conference from the African Development Bank in Kigali. And the theme of the session was making Ro making Rwanda or making Kigali the next Silicon Valley. And it was a good session, and people were talking and very optimistic. And everyone knows Rwanda has made a lot of progress. But there was a great speaker from SAP 
this big German software company who's an American guy. And he had a really good point. He said, you know what? The US has been working to make New York City the next Silicon Valley for 40 years. And it's it hasn't worked, right? Silicon Valley is not working in New York. It's not working in London. It's not working in Berlin. Silicon Valley is a unique place. So self-employment is a whole different ball of wax. Um, if you want to go for self-employment, you should. Um, you should consider it, but uh, there's only, I only know of one group of people who tried it and then they ended up going back to their jobs. And there's a second guy who he's somewhere in an in-between situation where he got hired, but now I think he's become a co-founder and is he's not fully self-employed, but he's uh, somewhere in that realm. But other than that, uh, nobody really. Um, so today, I think it's a really good point. Um, I would recommend that every single person here on the 31st of July starts looking around for some organization where they can volunteer, work for free um, for a couple hours or full time or something where they can just get some experience on their CV, look for a good project. There are enough volunteer organizations around or companies where if you were to say, look, I'm ready to work for nothing. I just want a little bit of experience and be open with them and say, hey, I'm uh, going to be applying for jobs in parallel, but in the meantime, I'm also going to be working with you and I'm happy to do it for three months. I think you'll find a lot of success in that approach, especially if you have if you're ready to do both. I mean, maybe you say I'm ready to work six hours a week, six hours a day, and I'm going to spend two hours a day on my personal projects, on getting all my materials ready, on applying for my five jobs a day, on writing, doing my lead code practice, and you take it like a full-time job and you're ready to do it for that three months, I think you would actually uh, be surprised at how successful you would be. Uh, yeah, Jeremy, that's uh, because the world is, it, the world works in mysterious ways. Um, we, we want to be able to recommend you and if you are unwilling to do uh, stuff that you don't like, then it makes it hard for us to recommend you. Um, I mean, it's as simple as that. I would also answer your question another way. If you get to your Web3 company and you're unwilling to do some of the more boring work, then I think you'll be, yeah, so I don't, I think the dream job of you get in there and you're doing like hard fundamental protocol level blockchain all the time, you may be surprised because in every job all the way up to, I mean, why does Mark Zuckerberg have Sheryl Sandberg working for him? Because there's boring stuff that he doesn't want to do. Same with Elon Musk, same with any job. So I think uh, it doesn't speak too well if you just say, look, I'm not going to do the stuff that I don't want to do. Um, very practically speaking, if you don't do those projects, we won't give you a certificate because we want to uh, we want to see you finish all the projects. And we believe that there is there's a lot that you can learn. And so if your approach is simply, this is not part of my field, I'm not interested, I'm not doing it. Um, yeah, this, it's not the right place. We're not we're simply not at the level where we can say, okay, you can specialize. We're just not there. So, yeah, if you don't, you need to finish all the projects. Um, is it ethical? It's not only ethical, it's fully ethical, it's recommended, it's a great idea, It's there's nothing wrong with it, um, people like it. You will be, everyone who's on this call will be surprised at how helpful people will be if you write to them and say, hey, I'm interested in data engineering, I saw what you've done, um, and you ask them a couple of good questions and maybe ask them for some advice or, if you ask some good questions, right? If you write to them and say, hey, can you help me get a job? Um, nobody's, you're less likely to get help. But if you say to them, hey, I see that you're an expert in Spark and uh, I am trying to find a good resource to learn Spark or Hadoop, or I see that you guys are using Snowflake at your company, or I've used a little bit of Kafka, but I haven't figured out exactly how to do it. Can you help me? Uh, or where do you recommend? Or why does your company use this approach and not that approach? Absolutely, I mean, that's it's perfect. So it's not only, I, I don't see why it would be unethical. Um, yeah. Um, so Binium, I think the, so the difference is you, you need a lot more SQL in 
data engineering, we need to focus a lot more on the pipeline development. Um, and so this is where you have to look, spend some time reading these diagrams from Anderson Horowitz, and then look at the link to the article. It's now been updated, but understanding they're working in different areas. I mean, let's, let's use the restaurant analogy. So it's true that the people who, there's the person who cooks the food and there's a person that prepares the food to be cooked. And they're both dealing with food and they're both dealing with hygiene and they're both dealing with pots, but their jobs are not exactly the same. Um, so in practice, I think the data engineers spend a lot more time thinking about how do you maintain pipelines? How do you improve pipelines? There's a whole new field called analytics engineering. There's also reverse ETL. There's also, I mean, it's changed just in the last year, it's changed a lot. So um, your question is, is there something we are not going to do in each of those paths? I think in a pure machine learning engineering role, you can assume that you have a clean pipeline of data which is coming in. Um, that may not always be true. It depends on a company. If you join a big company, that's probably true. In a small company, you probably have to clean the data yourself. Um, and I think on the data engineering side, I think you can assume that the majority of your work is on acquiring the data and you're not as worried about uh, what happens to it after that. Abel, um, a number of tasks, including those three tracks. No, you had, you need to pick one because you only have a limited amount of time. Um, and this is based on our experience. So if you were to list, let's say we listed all of your projects. I mean, just look at the, look at the 10 projects that you would have completed by the end of the training. Which one do you put first? I mean, you're, you, you do need to make a decision. And if you want to list all of your skills, if you list 65 different skills, unfortunately, people aren't going to read it or it'll get lost in the mess. So if you want to, if you want a data engineering job and you're talking about that you're an expert in using PyTorch and you're also good at uh, using Algorand, the data engineering recruiter probably doesn't care. So <clears throat> the simplicity, um, I, I read this great quote which I, I think about regularly, I find it hard to implement. Um, clear thinking doesn't require intelligence. It requires courage. And so I think what we're asking each of you to do this week is to have the courage to pick one track and to stick with it. So it's less about intelligence because it is, it, you just don't have, you just don't know, right? You could get, you, one of you guys could get a job at Google and your manager is a jerk. It happens, right? So you you can't control that necessarily. You won't know that going into it. So pick one track and have the courage to stick with it is what I'm saying. And that's, you have a limited amount of people's time and energy. And it's just like if you meet somebody and you're trying to tell them your entire history of all the different things that you've done, you're not going to keep their attention. It's much more important to say, this is what I want from you uh, that's why they call it the 30 second elevator pitch and not the 30 minute elevator pitch. You have, um, like Eminem said, you have one chance and you don't want to lose that chance. For those of you who like Eight Mile, you guys, is a great song. Um, you guys know that song? No, this is where it's hard and when it's online, but keep asking questions. These are good questions. You guys can also put your hands up. I'm gonna look at the poll in the meantime to see how people are feeling. Somebody's not sleeping. Um, yeah, I, I hope it does. I mean, so we wanna, so Baruch's question, what if we don't get a job within the three month job search phase? I hope we can continue it. Um, what I can say personally is if there's somebody who's motivated, you may have to chase me, but I will be there. I will personally be ready to help each and every person get a do what I can to get a job. Um, and part of the reason is let's let's be very direct about it. Ten Academy will not be financially viable if you guys don't earn money. So our promise to you is we will help you get a job and you will make a contribution to be able to run the next batch of training. If that doesn't work, then our model isn't working. So we, we have aligned incentives. 
we want you to get work so we can continue. But what's in practice, Baruch, what happens is most people, when they get onto the right track and they, they get into the rhythm, just like I think everyone who's on this call right now is in the rhythm of they know, they know what's coming next week. You guys have made arrangements, so you're getting the work done. People are working hard. Somehow you found a way to get the internet. All of you are eating. Uh, eating. You guys have plans with your on weekends, on Sundays, you do something else. Once you get into that rhythm, then I think for most people, you've settled in and it's easy. You're just going to have to establish a new rhythm. And after three months, when you're in that rhythm, and we want to make sure that you finish at the end of July with the right materials and you start applying and after a month you start getting interviews, then I think uh, most people will figure it out. But yeah, I mean, I can, we will be there to help as much as we can and I can give you my, uh, that commitment from my side. You may have to chase me, but I will uh, offer support as I can. One thing that I think we figured out is we can get most people an interview. Uh, and if people follow the system, then the interview thing does work out. Now, getting people through the interviews is where there's upscaling and work that has to be done. I would actually, and if anyone's worried about interviews, so the uh, person who really blew me away on in the debate session where there was no, it was just such a, not only a pleasant conversation, but it was a very, um, in terms of content, it was very meaningful and it was, really perfect interview preparation is one of your colleagues here on this call. And so I think this just practicing and talking and all of that, it's, um, you, have to, you have to be ready to practice that. And for those of you who where English is not your first language, I would encourage you to find 10 or 15 minutes a day just talking, talk to a native speaker and just discuss, just talk about something to the point where you can speak naturally. I mean, I have the same problem. I live in Germany, my German is not fluent, and I wish that I had spent 10 or 15 minutes a day just talking about football or politics or the weather or whatever it is, because that fluency comes. All of you can speak English, but not all of you speak comfortably. Um, yeah. So Martin, we, we would ask them what they're looking for in terms of the track and also in terms of the skills. So some people have different stacks. Some people say, look, I want somebody who's really good at Java because that's what we use. Somebody says, I want somebody who we need help with deployment. So somebody who's has a bit of AWS experience or somebody, somebody might say, I want a really solid React developer. So depending on what they want, we then uh, try and find the closest match. And we do consider people's performance during the training. Uh, we do consider who has been helpful to the community um, because some companies rather want um, people who are helpful. Uh, we do consider who's good at finding work as opposed to um, who really needs clear direction. And then we'll simply uh, find the closest match and we'll consider performance overall as well and then send the three prof profiles and then it's up to the employer. Um, open source project. So Nahom, I think I would actually like you to do, or everyone here to do that work. I think what we can also do is create three separate channels afterwards for once the decisions have been made and we can start sharing this, these sorts of materials, um, in those channels. Um, how many partners do we have in total? I don't know. I mean, what, what does that mean? Uh, so we have some companies who they have already hired. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready to hire another one. Um, because they have to have a project need, they have to have a budget, they need someone to supervise. We have a big list of people that we're interested in reaching out to. Um, people like what we're doing, but we don't necessarily, I can't give you a number. Um, but I'm, I'm somehow not super worried. We only have 37 people here. And so maybe my summary message to you is <clears throat> you guys are within uh, spitting distance to being able to get a job. There's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done. But if you follow the system and stay with it in a dedicated way, then everyone here should be able to match into work within, um, yeah, I, I don't want to say by October. It may take till Christmas time for everyone to match. And there's some people who will just not, and that's fine because they want to go and do something else. But those people who are 
if you stick with the system, I believe that the results will come, and that's that's based on my experience. Uh, in which respect, Binya? How's the batch doing? Uh, I think it's better to talk. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the numbers uh, is the uh, total trainees that has gotten more than the previous ones, or is it somewhat, somewhat better? Next, uh, in general, uh, the performance wise. It's it's very it's very hard to measure. I think this uh, I think it's definitely I think this the training is going well. I can say that, and I think you guys, everyone, the overall batch is exceeding our expectations. So I think that uh, yeah, I mean, I I can say that much. I think we're also more organized. We're also more clear on what it is that we want to do, which might help. Uh, we have uh, we have more experience and. But yeah, the trainees are exceeding our expectations. I think that you can see, I mean, the best thing for me is when previous employers come back and talk to you guys, right? So yesterday you had Kanumi, we had Pivot Bio before. There's a number of other companies that we could bring back, but the enthusiasm that they have in coming and speaking to you guys is, it's a sign that actually there's, there's value. So I wouldn't, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to tell you other than you guys can definitely make it. It's not, it's not going to be a free ride, just like the work that you've done to go from applying to get to here. I think everyone's put in a lot of work, but it's, it's also true that if you just follow the system, then it kind of makes it a little bit easier, right? We're not throwing you out into the deep end and say, good luck. We're saying we have a system, we want you to follow the system and uh, you will, it, it should work out. So Martin, I think, I mean, this is where we have to, now there, you have to find your own, I can't give you that answer. We have to, I'm happy to discuss with you. We can talk about it uh, maybe also a little bit later, but I think you have to do your own research and say, this is an opportunity that I found. Um, what do you think? Or should I do this? Or can I do this? It's, it's a little bit difficult for me to, um, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit difficult for me to, give you a clear answer there. There may not be a clear answer, but I think that as you start going out and applying for jobs and getting active on LinkedIn and talking to other people, you'll find stuff. So I, I don't know exactly what you mean when you talk about factors. Maybe you can unmute. Okay, uh, I was meaning like uh, factors to consider when uh, you are looking for which enterprise to volunteer for, uh, because you might uh, find you might find that um, you are you are actually like you are doing so much volunteering, but there is nothing coming in at the end of the day. Or you find you volunteered for like fifteen places, but at the end of the time, it's there is nothing coming. But so, like, what are the factors like? Fifteen uh, places. Who? <laughs> Why well, would you, you should volunteer for one? Oh, Why would yeah. you volunteer for fifteen places? Oh, like like you volunteered for the first place that you, you worked with them no, for some no, time. No, 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 pick one place that you can spend three months at. Yeah, like I mean, like you've maybe volunteered time and again, time and again. But you shouldn't. Then I mean, this is where we have to be. Then we should talk. I mean, why is it not working? So where's the gap? there's probably a gap in a skill. There's some gap that is addressable. If you're always volunteering, then you have a gap in your skills. What employers are looking for and what you can offer in terms of your skills, there's a gap, so let's plug that gap. Amal, nobody's gonna get a job on the, nobody's gonna start work on the 1st of August. So it's fine. I mean, maybe it's a question of expectations, but it just will, as I said, even the most motivated company, it'll take four weeks, six weeks to get from HR to contract to processing to get access onto the system. So my advice to everyone would be 
keep applying for jobs, keep improving your skills. Let's. Um, uh, I mean, we have a list of things that we're going to be asking you to doing to do once we get into the supported job search phase. Do that. Uh, work on a project. Write articles. Do. And there's no shortage of things that we're going to ask you to do. Improve your timed coding challenges, um, like lead code and other things like that. Go teach someone. Um, improve the projects that you did where you didn't fully understand them. Go deeper in other areas. Teresa? Okay, thank you, Arun and others. Uh, yeah, actually, what I need to talk is uh, we are now focusing on job issues. But maybe sometimes getting a job is, uh, as my perspective, it is a chance sometimes, and it is up to communication, uh, up to promoting ourselves and so on things. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a question, what I have is, uh, for example, we may use the knowledge we get from your academy here and there. Maybe we will promote ourselves, we will research on something and we will we will get some uh, project uh, doing it local even to uh, participate in many things. So it is a good opportunity. So there is a, a payback uh, rule that we have assigned signed with you. Mm -hmm. uh, just just it is that it doesn't mean uh, we, we place ourselves uh, in a court, but uh, as ten academy, for example, if uh, someone haven't get any work uh, job in the time uh, in the time gap, and uh, if uh, someone is idle and he he was working in his side, uh, just doing on some other things, the success may be in different things. So, what do you expect from us? Maybe as a support, maybe as your alumni. So, what support the academy? No, I think we've been clear and said if you're, we only want you to pay it forward once you're earning five hundred dollars a month or more. So once you have a full-time stable job, then we want you to pay it forward. So if you are earning a little bit here and there, you do a small project on Upwork, or you're doing some teaching here and there, you don't need to make a paid forward payment until you get a regular full-time job. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think there was one more question. The communication. Um, yeah, so we'll set up a schedule. I think we plan three stand-ups per week. Um, we're going to be asking people to be reporting back in a two-week sprint cycle. We'll keep the Slack open. We may probably use the same one. We have to see. Um, and then we want, yeah, I, I basically want people to be reporting on what they're doing. Um, I want, if you're not getting a job or you're, if, forget about getting a job, it's going to go from rejections interviews and interviews also have many stages first phone screening technical screening time coding challenge second screening we want to keep in track keep in touch on all of those things so this there's no no one no company is going to give you a job you're going to get a first phone screening you might get a technical challenge you might get a time coding challenge you might get a second interview a third interview a fourth interview then you might get an offer then you need to decide then there may be a reference check it's a multi-stage process so and it's only after that that this kind of job thing comes through uh, or the offer comes through and then you can you can get work. So we will set up that infrastructure for people to um, to stay in touch. And that'll probably include, as I said, stand ups and it'll include Slack. It'll include reporting. Um, yeah. But we've we've done this before I and mean, we've started to figure out. So two years ago, it was we didn't know what to do. Uh, five years ago, we had no idea what to do. So now we have a pretty good idea of what to do. Um, but there are some areas, for example, there's some areas where most people will need to improve. Communication for many people, they'll have to practice. If you guys can, if you guys can somehow get a hold of Daisy to interview with you, she did. Or she was the person I mentioned. She did exceptionally well in the sparring. She was out of everyone that we spoke to. Daisy was Daisy was the Elon Musk of sparring. Uh, but nicer than Elon Musk. So you guys should find a way to sort of like maybe get her on the phone and see if you can chat to her and see how she did it. Uh, or maybe we do an open spar. And you guys should ask for help if you want uh, her and me to do like a five-minute back and forth or we can do the aliens 
thing with Daisy and she can be for or against aliens, just to practice, just to hear how does she respond to it. Super. Um, SQL, I already mentioned, timed coding challenges are a big one. People's efficiency in terms of Python programming is something that most people have to improve on. Improving the projects where they didn't do well, getting a few demonstration projects together is another area to improve on. Um, doing a capstone, making their LinkedIn visible, connecting with people. None of these are hard, but it's just like running a business. And this is the hardest, this is the, putting all of those things together means you will jump over this gap. And once you jump over the gap and you have real work experience, things do get easier. So this is basically kind of the end of this goal that we have for everyone here. We want people to get their first job and we want people to get their their first global level job. And so we're trying to jump over two gaps in three to six months. So it is difficult, but you guys are doing well. So I think we have time for two last questions and then I need to run. I'm just looking at the poll people. There's one person who isn't sleeping. Two people are worried. Um, and the ready, the, yeah, I think most people should be in the relaxed and ready, but ready for a stressful time. So I'd like to hear from uh, two questions from the ladies in the group. Are there any questions from the ladies? I think they've, I don't know if anyone asked, Amal asked a question. Um, anyone else? Two of the ladies. Amal, yeah. Hi, Amal. Hi, Amal. Okay, so I have a question. Um, I remember when we, are, we were applying for the Chain Academy program, uh, you told us about uh, one project that uh, we believe uh, we would like to do it. Um, I don't know if you remember that. Say it again. Where where you have to you'd like to do it? Like uh, we're aspiring to 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 use AI and ML. Ah yeah yeah during the application phase yeah. Yeah. So, is there a way we can uh, we can uh, do the project, or how is it? What was the data about? Why did we ask the question? Yes. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, no one's ever asked me that. It's a good question. Um, so, it's we find it to be a good differentiating question for a couple of reasons. One is, you can see there's a lot of people who just wrote nothing, or people who wrote like a one line answer. So we wanted to see, are people going to write? The second is we wanted to see, did people think about the problem? Was the problem at scale? Was it a sustainable problem? And was there a solution? Did, you, did they actually use technology to solve their problem? So it was more just to evaluate uh, that. And then the presentation, did people listen to feedback? So we were testing a number of things while trying to encourage you to uh, stimulate that creative juice. Um, I don't remember what your submission was. We can go back and look at it. But yeah, I, I think it's probably if if it's the right sort of thing where you could get started, then consider it. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, but I mean, evaluate it critically. If you think that it's a good place to get started, then start on it. If you want to ask some of your colleagues here in the batch five to get started on it with you, then talk to people. I would like to see talk from uh, Phil Clay from MIT, a former chancellor of MIT, African-American guy. And one of the main points that he made last year was there are more than enough jobs for everyone here. Nobody here is competing with anyone else. You would be much better served if you collaborate as much as possible. And in the long run, you will be amazed at how much more the relationships build and you, you benefit from each other than any aspect of competition. So I would like to see this, um, that the, we move at this on how to get jobs, which CV is working, or I found this great open source repository that we should all be contributing to, or the workshop that's happening, or there's a free talk which is taking place, or there's this company that's hiring, or um, I just got a job and have another open position. I mean, there's, there's so many possible things that we could be doing. Um, last question, any of the ladies? We have Stella, we have Salam, Ikma, um, Matilda, Daisy, Rafa, Meron, 
Nardos, and I think that's that's it. Miriam. So I'm going to studiously observe, uh, ignore the questions from the men in the meantime. Any other questions? One more. Daisy? Um, thank you. So mine is about um, selection of maybe say companies you want to work with. I've been reading a lot of stories online about maybe say black people are more excited to work from home um, post COVID and they're not excited about going back to work. Um, simply because working from home allows them to miss out on a lot of um, bias and a lot of office politics that goes on at the workplace. So I was just wondering if we are going to have a session on just how well to work with a cross-cultural team or if maybe the things we may have to drop while um, stepping in to work with um, such teams or really like what kind of adjustment is um, called upon when you especially what would say local companies. <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't think, I and mean, did you say that black people like to work from home? I, I, I didn't see that one. Is that what you said? Uh, yes, people of color rather. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, so I, I didn't see that. I haven't, I didn't read that anywhere. Um, doesn't mean it's not true. I mean, what we tried to do is, I mean, this is the, we've tried to simulate in some way a professional intercultural work environment. Um, but I think the question you're asking is, our way to teach that was to try and make people speak during stand-ups, to have the community sessions, that people attend tutorials, that people talk. You work in teams, you work in pairs, and so you get used to that. Now, we don't have a very diverse group in terms of nationality here. We had, I think last year we had nine countries, this year we only have four. So there's this sort of convergence, which is unexpected. Nevertheless, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't, if, if you have any, maybe if you, if you help us figure out what sort of training do you feel like you need, then I would be happy to work with the team to try and provide it. But I don't know it right now beyond the sort of setup, and we've tried to set it up similar to what you would find in a work environment and expecting that most of you will be working remotely. Um, I mean, I think most people are actually by and large ready. I think there's some people who do have to practice speaking and communicating. I think that some people will struggle in finding work as opposed to being told to do work. Um, there's other things that will come, but you have to remember that we're also clear that you should be taking a junior level job. We're not asking you to become a manager. And so a junior level job, fresh university graduate is pretty well understood that they're not, most companies aren't expecting a huge amount of autonomy. So I think my short answer is if you can manage well here, you'll be fine. Um, but we're probably missing some stuff. And so if anyone in the group has ideas, I'd love to see them uh, written down in the All Careers channel and just tag me, tag Miriam, tag Carrie, and we'll find a way to, um, we'll try and find a way to address them. Uh, okay, um, just one last question. Also, while looking at organization, how do you, how do you make sure that you get into a company that um, will sort of assure um, your technical growth, rather like a company that invested in your growth as a person, how are you able to rule out such companies from the rest? So I think you should prepare those questions during an interview. Um, so that's one. The second is I would look at LinkedIn and figure out, see who's working there, because it has, LinkedIn has a lot of powerful tools. Who's working there, where have they come from, what, was their, what were their growth trajectories like? Um, you can get a lot of, let's say, other sorts of signals uh, in your sort of pre-search. I would spend time looking at their job advertisements. How are they written? If they're poorly written, if they're rushed, then maybe the company is in a rush versus having a professional HR team. Um, but I would really ask those questions during an interview as well. And the right sort of companies will be happy to, to talk to you about that. 
Um, but I think that's, it's like a relationship, right? You can date somebody for 10 years, live together and do everything. But after you get married, sometimes it's life is, you can also be surprised. So I would, all of that gives you some information, but there's still no guarantees in life. Salam. Okay. Well, my question is, um, how was your success on the pe on the previous batch, especially when it comes to uh, the ladies? Uh, because uh, um, it's mostly more male-dominated fields. The three fields are male-dominated fields. So, what would you advise us? Um, I think the, the ladies are very well placed. Um, most companies are interested in hiring more women because their teams are very male-dominated. We have a our ratio in batch five is not good enough, but it's still, compared to the field, it's much higher. Um, we're at 35%, I believe, and the field is on average 15%. So I think for, I think most women, it's actually easy. We ran out of women pretty quickly in batch four. I know we still have some people who are available, but yeah, I think for the ladies, it, I, my suggestion would be the same as everyone else. Um, and honestly speaking, I find it easier. I think during the job search process, it's somehow a little bit, uh, I find the women get placed faster than most of the men. And part of it is approach, part of it is what companies are looking for. Um, this is kind of a generalization, but most of, most of the women we have in the group are much better at communicating than the men that we have. So that's also very important. So I'm somehow, yeah, I'm not too, too worried. I think we'll actually do fine. Um, in batch three, we took us a, it took us a while to figure, you were talking about success. Um, it took us a while to figure out how to get people interviews. And I think we had to change a couple of things and then it started to work. Um, it took us a while to realize where some of the skill gaps were and where the trainees were quote unquote failing. And so now we have suggestions on how to improve that. It took us a while to figure out a number of things. And so from batch one to batch five, <clears throat> the process has really just been continual improvement. So I think it will be, we haven't, we've by no means figured everything out, but I think it will always, it, we've continued to improve that system and that process. And I believe it'll just keep getting better. So I think in batch four, we did much, we got, it took a while to get people into jobs. It was a little bit faster than batch three, but the quality of jobs and the average salary of the jobs was much higher. And batch four was the first time that individuals without our help found international jobs by themselves. So in batch three, not a single person got an interview at an international level company without our help. In batch four, people got their own interviews, many interviews with international companies and some people got those jobs by themselves. So that's already progress. And so we believe that we can build on that and say, now we can expect that most of you will be able to get international level interviews and we have to work together how to figure out how to get you through those international level interviews and to plug those skill gaps that you have. So I need to run. I have a call in 15 minutes that I need to prepare for, but I, I found today's session to be very positive um, I would like to hear these questions continue, but I'm also, we're, we're now, as we're two thirds, almost two thirds through, we're 60% through the training. Let's also switch modes. And if you guys, if the group wants something from us, if you need more information, Daisy asked about, um, Daisy asked about the cultural aspect. Amal asked about, why did you ask us this question? Let's, let's indeed switch roles or switch modes from, teacher student to we are a group of people working together to solve this challenge that all of us have and the challenge is we want all 37 of you to get a good job and whatever you need from us within reason we're we're prepared to provide so if you need something then ask for it if you have a suggestion make the suggestion and we're no let's you know we're we're beyond this teacher student uh thing we're now a group of people, 37 plus, I don't know how many we are on our team, five to 10 people, let's say 45 people working together to get 37 jobs. Yeah? So I'm gonna run and stop recording first. Um,